Now, as you all know, I love the movies and I love movie podcasts. And now one of the greatest movie podcasts of all time is available right here on the Forever Dog Podcast Network. It's called Black Man Can't Jump in Hollywood. This beloved podcast reviews films with leading actors of color and analyzes them in the context of race and Hollywood's diversity issues. Plus, it's funny and a pleasure to listen to. Jump into Black Men Can't Jump today. The hosts, Jariah Milligan, James Three, and John Braylock, have an incredible back catalog of over 150 movies that you can check out right now. And brand new episodes every Monday featuring discussions about brand new movies like Widows, Black Klansmen, Crazy Rich Asians, Black Panther, whatever the big movie out that weekend is, the guys are on it. And you want to be in on those conversations. Movie lovers, culture lovers, comedy lovers, subscribe to Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts today. And now, on to the show. Forever. Dog. I used to think that this was my town. What a stupid thing to think. I hear you biting off a brain now I myself am on the brain I used to want to be a real man I don't know what that even means What's up, 3Bs? What's up, Diamond Dogs? What's up, Athletic Gerbils? Guess what? It's Rhea Butcher back hosting this show. It's been a minute. I, look, life happens. Also, baseball isn't happening right now. Or at least in the United States. Um, Anybody watch any of that, uh like tour of japan that they did that was pretty cool i can't stay up that late though so i had to watch like highlights and stuff but very neat to see that i don't know i liked it a lot um yes but i look i moved i moved i haven't moved in a long time and especially not by myself so (laughs) i've uh been a little tired and had a lot of shit going on um and also i would just say this i'm doing really great so please don't try to infer negativity from this um it's simply just uh what's going on for me and to sound not totally out of my mind i'm actually doing really well so everybody just stay calm everybody be cool everybody be cool (laughs) and uh just be like great that sounds good um because i don't want to get fully into the details of my specific of my like personal life completely but at the same time that's what's going on for me um Yes. So I do think that during the off season, these episodes, especially right now for the rest of the year, my hope is to get one out before the end of the year. That is a full episode review of a baseball film. However, holidays are happening. And again, like I said, I moved right now. I'm sitting on the floor next to a couch. I could be sitting on a couch, but I don't have a coffee table. And look, this is a, I don't even know if you would say it was a first world problem. It's like a I don't even know. It is a first world problem to be like, I don't have a coffee table. My life's terrible. I didn't say my life was terrible. I just said I don't have a coffee table. But I will say, side note, pretty difficult to have a couch and not a coffee table. Anybody been there? It's it's just an annoying thing you didn't realize was annoying because you had a coffee table. You know what I mean? (laughs) So I'm sitting in front of the couch, recording this on the floor, looking at all my various piles of things that I've essentially just like moved around this apartment space that I'm in for the past couple weeks. But I also was realizing the other day, it's the 21st, I moved in on the 1st, and I've gotten very far. It's very habitable. Habitable? Habitual? That's not the right word either. Um, I'm I'm able to live in it very easily. And like I said, it's just um, piles of boxes of things that don't have a home yet. So that's kind of an interesting... I'm just like shifting... Last night... I was, like, shifting another pile going, like, you're getting close. You're getting real close. Um, But it's such a specific feeling because once your spot is set up, that you don't really do that anymore. Unless you're like me and you grew up a hoarder and then you do do that all the time and you never throw any of it away. I've done a pretty decent job at throwing some stuff away. Also, I might add, I know I've talked about meditating on here a lot, but this morning I wanted to, today I'm recording this, on the anniversary of the day slash night that I got into a very bad bike accident, which was, I would say, 100% my fault. (laughs) And I'll tell you why. Because I went to an open mic, and that open mic would give away prizes throughout the night. And one of the prizes that it gave me was 
it wasn't Four Loco, but it was a sim- It was a another like malt liquors brand of Four Loco. They gave me that as a reward, which I have learned that alcohol as a reward is a bad thing for me specifically. I have over five years of not drinking. Uh, I like to think that I'm sober. I also haven't done the steps, so I'm fully aware that. I kind of like went to the car wash and I rinsed my car off. So look, I'm doing the best that I can. I don't drink. I'm very actively aware of everything around it. That's where I'm at. So congrats to everybody that's done the steps. Congrats to people that haven't done the steps but have been able to quit drinking when they need to quit drinking. Congrats to everybody who's living their life better. So I get this thing. I probably had two beers that night. And then I also, at the very end of it, drank that thing. Because I was like, oh, this is funny. And then I was, I don't know that I would say I was fine, but I was okay. And I got on my bike. And as soon as I started riding my bike, that thing that I drank kicked in. And then I hit a pothole or the side view mirror of a car. And I flipped over my handlebars. I thought for sure I got hit by a car. (laughs) But after some time realizing what happened, I realized what happened. And I flipped over my handlebars. I landed on my face because that drink hit me so hard that I didn't even put up, which at the same time is like probably good because I didn't break my arms. I landed on my face and then my whole body just sort of like flew forward from the fulcrum of my face. And in doing so, I broke two ribs. So like my whole face, like my, I think it was the right side of my face got so torn up, I landed on the street, and then I just started pulling my bike onto the sidewalk, and somebody, luckily, somebody drove by, this was also super late, it was like midnight, um, somebody drove by and saw me and was an off-duty police officer and called an ambulance, and then I took an ambulance, I went to the hospital, and then for weeks, I, I had to work from home, I also had to take time off of work, and, uh, you, Because you can't... I used to have a big bit about it. You can't do anything for broken ribs. You just have to wait them out. Uh, so I had to spend so much time on the couch that I made it to the end of Netflix. That was my whole joke. So at least I got something out of it. But my whole point of bringing this up, which was perhaps bad, but I didn't injure anyone else. So I don't feel like this is really just me going like, yeah, I did a bad thing. Um, I maybe like... I took people's sympathy, but also I really thought for sure I got hit by a car for a while. <laughs> so I, I wasn't doing it out of like malice or, or lying. It took me a while to figure out what had happened. Um, so this moment, regardless of this understanding of myself, was a moment where I realized, and again, this was seven years ago, um, I realized, oh, life can go away really quickly. Um, I think, you know, mortality is something that you keep learning every day. <laughs> And so after that happened, I realized, like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, like, live my life, and I'm gonna do, and, I, you know, I wish I, that had been the moment that I was like, oh, I need to, I need to change everything, but I didn't, I lived in Chicago, it's very hard to quit drinking in Chicago, but that's when I went, like, full force into stand-up and, like, followed the thing I wanted to do, so there is that kind of amazing thing that I got out of it. Uh, and then I, you know, I moved to Los Angeles within a year of that. And then within a year of that, I quit drinking. So my whole point of bringing this whole thing up on a baseball podcast. Now you, if you, you listen to this regularly, so you know that I'm, I talk about other shit, but you just, you know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. You miss a hundred percent of the pitches you don't swing at, which is like the whole point of this podcast. You get three swings. So I'm sure that I've already taken up in the grand scheme of things, all three of my swings, but at the same time, like that really felt like one and I'm really grateful to still be here. And I'm really grateful to have found out and realized that like, I can't drink. It's just part of my life. Um, I love beer. I love craft beer. I miss IPAs all the time. Cause they like smell good. I like, I love the craft of all of it. Like it's all, you know, like we live in this country it's everywhere i like a good manhattan or whatever but i also like a good five beams on the rocks too so like i can't i just can't do it and the reason i'm talking about this is i don't know a lot of people have told me like they wish that i talked about 
not drinking a lot more. And I think that um, I will keep talking about it and write jokes about it so it's on stage and stuff. But um, it's the holiday season, and I this is a tough time to be a sober person or a, a, a reformed person, whatever you want to consider yourself to be. And so I also used to use, like, medical marijuana to sleep because um, I had some, like, sleep issues. I've talked about this a lot. It's legal in California. And I stopped doing that, like, a couple months ago. Had a moment where I used it and was like, oh, yeah, you shouldn't use this. And I was grateful for that. I didn't feel, like, regret and sadness and and anxiety, and I didn't beat myself up for it. I just went, oh, you were right. Because what I found with my sort of issues, my ordeals or whatever, (laughs) my issues with substances, is I have a moment where I'm like, should you be doing this? And then I my brain tells me you should do it to find out whether you shouldn't. And like that is actually the like addiction part of your brain telling you like, yeah, just do it. Even though you're aware that you shouldn't, or maybe you don't want to, but like just having the feeling that you don't want to isn't enough. You actually have to go like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. Um, but I'm grateful for that experience because it taught me that. So now I know that. Um, but I stopped using that because I was really only pretty much using it to sleep so at night right before I went to bed and um what I realized was I needed to feel everything I was going through because it was painful I went through like a painful time and um but I you know I'm like I said uh, up top I'm feeling really good about it and I was feeling really good about it throughout you know like I was feeling good and that's what I was learning about sadness and joy is that they coexist <laughs> you know I spent a lot of time very depressed um for a lot of reasons and mostly in my 20s because I I just wasn't I wasn't prepared to be out in the world and not in a like I was spoiled and I didn't didn't know how to like I just literally wasn't set up I didn't you know my folks didn't move out my folks didn't go to college my folks didn't go live somewhere else my folks like literally moved back in with their parents when their marriage ended and like that's I'm proud of that like that's I'm proud of them I'm I'm happy that they got that done I think they're okay I think they both wish they would have maybe done something differently I don't know that's me just guessing but like I'm not ashamed of that at all but it also led to a serious amount of depression when I didn't understand how the world worked and I didn't have anybody that was telling me like this is how it goes and it's gonna be all right because I didn't have anybody that did that (laughs) so they didn't know and they didn't know what to tell me and I was in an echo chamber of my own brain going like, oh, Jesus, I don't know. This is the end of my life, right? Like, I'm I'm in debt. I, I'm 21, and I'm in debt to the government. <laughs> I'm never going to pay this off. <laughs> and that's why I put it in that uh, the show, Take My Wife, because I knew it was relatable. And it was, like, hanging over my head for my entire 20s. And it didn't need to be. I look back on it now, and it didn't need to be because I could you know, defer it or whatever. But um, anyway, I don't know. This is a big tangential thing. I started talking about the USA players in Japan, and now I'm talking about, like, surprise. Anyway, it's the holidays, and that's why I'm talking about it. This is a tough time to to not partake in drinking. And, you know, the thing is, there are these tough moments. You know, New Year's, Christmas, Thanksgiving, these are all tough holidays to not be drinking, especially if, you know, you quit and you also like it, you know? I think most people kind of do. And I think that's okay. It's okay to still like it. Like, I quit smoking. I love smoking. It's disgusting. So both those things exist in my body, kind of like I was saying about the joy and sadness. But it's tough. So the whole point of me bringing all this shit up is that if you are a person who is sober or is cleaned up and is refraining from using substances because you found that it has made your life better to not do those things but it is difficult to not get to participate with your pals or your family or whatever i get it that's the whole point of me having this rambling thing at the beginning of my baseball podcast i get it i get it so if other people around you do not understand and it's hard to have other people understand if they're not sober it's truly hard i mean i was even talking to somebody just the other day and I, I admit to people when I'm fully, when I'm talking about it 
when I'm going to be talking about it more than 30 seconds, where, when it's not just going like, oh, I don't drink, and then moving on to, to another. If, if I'm going to engage in conversation about it, I do like to tell people, like, I'm sober because I'm aware of that as a thing, but I haven't done the 12 steps. And then if someone is not sober, they love to tell me, like, well, I don't follow those. And it's like, well, you don't, you're not, you don't have anything to do with this. So you don't get to, I mean, that's great. I'm glad you, like, accept me, but, like, you're not a sober person. So, those are the ones that make the rules. But um, anyway, so if you don't have other sober people in your life, other than at your meetings and stuff like that, it's it's tough. It's tough. I spent a lot of time out here like that. And everybody was so nice to me. I'm not, nobody, nobody's being shitty. It's just that it's almost like, oh my God, everyone. It's almost like being queer. <laughs> and don't get mad because I'm, I'm comparing something that could be seen as negative, like a drinking problem to being queer. I'm not. I'm simply comparing the cultural implications, which is that often you, person who is queer that's listening, might be the only queer person in the space, as far as you know. It's something that happens for us a long time, uh, a lot. Also, it I could compare this to many different axes of identity and, and all those things. Like, it could be, you know, immigrant or... Uh, non-binary or uh let's see literally anything nothing else is coming to my mind <laughs> it's very early um so anyway i'm not gonna like apologize or point out the fact that i'm rambling anymore because i feel like that's what you like about this podcast that's why you listen to me so anyway i think you know and there's a lot of sobriety in the queer community just like in other communities but um you know i don't know we have so many things we need to discuss as a community in the queer community. Um, also, I saw somebody saying that, like, community is inherently racist. And, like, I get that. But also, come on. <laughs> come on. We got to. All right. Okay. Okay. Like, yes. If you're talking about, like, geographical in the United States, yes. But we're talking about whatever. Anyway, I can't even get into that. Um, I don't know why I brought it up. I brought it up. It's my podcast. So... My whole point was to say that I see all of you and I believe in you. And also, if something happens and you make a mistake or you wander off your path, it will be okay. And what you got to do is face what you did, look at it, say, why did I do that? And then tell yourself you're not going to do it again. And then start all over again. I think also something that we get into, and, and I remember this, it was part of why I stopped being vegan, honestly. I wrote this down the other day. I was like, Vegans are the worst part of being vegan. And I wanted to say it, but that's something you kind of can't say on the internet because people will get mad because they can't hear your tone of your voice or see your face and see that you're kidding or know that you're a lifetime vegetarian and so you're kind of like, you know, shouting from inside of the house or whatever. But my point of that is not to shit on vegans. My point of that is that people are always the problem with something. Like veganism isn't a bad thing. It's a great thing. It is literally a great thing. And there have been many societies and cultures that were vegan not just by choice, but by simply by geography and what was growing around them. And they weren't eating animals yet. Also, so the thing that I brought up was there was like in the vegan community, or at least the vegans I was around, number one, they talked about it incessantly. And I was like, can we talk about like movies or something? Like this is, I don't want to talk about this every day. I, I talk about it every time I go to a restaurant because I have to tell every single person I'm vegan, what's vegan. And then people didn't know what it was. So I had to explain it. And I just, it's so much, it's a lot different now. And this was like 10 years ago, but it was all about how long you've been vegan and like how the streak of being vegan. And like, I get being proud of something and I get being like, yay, I, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I've just learned that like, that doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. The like streak of like how many days, how many years have you got under your belt? It's like, I don't know. I've got 36 years of living on this planet under my belt. That's what's important to me. <laughs> I've been on this planet for 36 years and I've done a lot of things while I've been on this planet. And my streak is that I'm still alive. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that is the only thing that matters to me. And so when things happen, mistakes or decisions or whatever, you just have to go like, great, okay, now my clock starts over again. Or, you know what, this time I'm not going to pay any attention to it. <laughs> this, I mean, the clock, that is. You know, I'm just going to go like, this is what I'm doing now. I learned a lesson. I learned something. And now I'm different. That is the most important part of it. So, I hope you learned a lesson, which is that I'm a sober person and I'm complicated. 
And we'll be right back after this with a rundown of the end of the year awards for men's Major League Baseball. So I heard about this company Everlane on other podcasts. I started to get back into a show that I like. I don't think I'm supposed to mention the show in the ad for something else. <laughs> and uh, it's this company called Everlane. And I'm always like, look, I, you know me, I buy a lot of clothes. And so I was excited when they were advertising on Three Swings, my podcast that you're listening to right now. And so I got to get a bunch of their stuff. And I got to tell you, I'm going to start wearing their stuff. I got their men's extra small fits me. So I don't have to buy J. Crew anymore. I, ooh, I'm not going to say that. So I'm switching. I'm Everlane all the way, buddy. I got a bag. I got a jacket. It's all really great stuff. I like it a lot. Um, and it got here really fast. So their shipping is really amazing. So like, why would you buy a t-shirt for $50 if you knew it only cost $7 to make? We wouldn't. With Everlane, you never overpay for quality clothes. Everlane only makes premium essentials using the finest materials without traditional markups. And they tell you their real costs. So you know you're never overpaying, which is very nice. Because Everlane sells directly to you, their prices are 30 to 50% lower than traditional retailers, and Everlane's clothes look better, cost less, and last longer. They have essentials like their Cotton Crew t-shirt, which I got and I love it, are exactly what they should be. Simple, stylish, and made from quality materials. I also got uh, two Buffalo Check button-up shirts. I have been looking for a green Buffalo Check shirt that fits me for about a year and a half. And guess what? Everlane came into my life, and now I have a green Buffalo Check shirt. The other one is teal. I love it a lot. Uh, also, they have a Cashmere Crew, uh, the 100% human tee, and the Twill Weekender bag. The thing I like about Everlane is that their stuff is all like timeless essentials, and they're just what you're looking for. No frills, just quality. And right now, you can check out our personalized collection at everlane.com slash baseball. Plus, you'll get free shipping on your first order. That's everlane.com slash baseball. Everlane.com slash baseball. All right, here we go. Uh, this was also part of why I delayed this episode coming out. I wanted to get all the awards out so I could talk about all of them so it wasn't like a piecemealed sort of a thing together. I also uh, just wanted to mention again and say, um, it's crazy. I'm really, I, it was a very complicated and emotional thing. And I don't really want to get into all of that because it's like personal and whatever. There was some interpersonal drama with my baseball team. But I just want to say that I can't believe it because I started this podcast and the description that bench coach Brett wrote for me was, you know, long-suffering baseball fan. And it's true. I have watched the team that I, like, love or am, like, into or whatever, like, fully into. Like, I'm clearly into the Dodgers, and I'm clearly complicated with Cleveland. I have watched, and, you know, like, I was rooting for KC, but I didn't, like, you know, I'm not, like, a Royals fan or anything. I didn't, like, like, I, I, I like the Dodgers. I, the other day I was like, I guess I'm a Dodger fan because I hate them. <laughs> So I feel like I've fully become a Dodger fan because I'm like, oh my, I hate them so much, but I keep putting Dodger shit up in my house. Um, I've watched the team that I love and care about lose the World Series. Is it four times now? It is four times now. I've watched them lose four times. That's a lot of times in a lifetime, I feel like, for a baseball fan. That's a lot of times. Can people tweet at me and tell me how many times they've watched their baseball team lose the World Series in their lifetime? Please tell me. Because, like, I would have to... You, you'd have to look it up. Because even somebody like uh, the Rockies... The, the Rockies only lost the World Series one time. And the Houston Astros only lost the World Series one time. And Chicago didn't lose the World Series for 108 years. They just didn't even make it for 108 years. So, like... That's a terrible, you know, that's a very long streak. But what I mean is making it to the World Series and then losing the World Series four times. Four. Four times. And that's over the course of 23 years. 36 overall, 23 years. The first time, I was 13. <laughs> the last time, 36. <laughs> so the whole point, four times I've watched my team lose the World Series. This is a team that I like. I own a, a jersey of a team of a player on the team. 
that's that's a lot you don't just do that well there's people that do that but you don't just do i don't just do that <sighs> so it took you know my friend phil who's a pitcher on my team who has a killer knuckleball said last night like he we were talking about this very thing and he was like i don't know this is when i got back into base you know whatever year was when i got back into baseball and oh, i almost wish i hadn't you know in that baseball way and i was like but phil i felt that way too i've watched my team lose the world series four times but if i hadn't gotten back into baseball and watching it i wouldn't have started playing it and then we won the world series i've never watched my team win the world series except on the field <laughs> i've played for a team that won a world series and that's nuts it's nuts i can't believe it and it was complicated but i had a crazy i had a wild ass se season i learned a lot and i'll talk about it sometime i guess what i learned <laughs> i'll talk about it sometime i have it i have a podcast right now why not say what i learned was i learned something very important i learned how to get along with men in a new way and it's really important because a lot of the guys on my team were really really supportive of me over this summer and really kind to me and really showed a lot of care caring for me and i don't think i would have made it through the summer if and my team did too so like overall my team but specifically these guys on this team i just like opened my eyes all of a sudden and realized like I've been playing with some of these guys for like five years and instead of seeing what they do and paying attention to them, I was always looking for the things that they would do that made me feel like, was that because I'm a girl? Was that because of this? And I realized I was looking for the bad. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm saying we need to stop doing this all the time, but I think we could stop doing it a little bit because like, yeah, we need to talk about privilege and we need to talk about these things all the time. but. Those things apply to the monolith of straight, white, cis, male. The monolith of that. And yes, some individual guys, a lot, a lot of them, have this behavior. Some of them do it with no intentionality whatsoever, which is what I realized. They, they were willing to listen to me talk about, like, this is, this is the thing that's happening. So why shouldn't I be willing to watch them or listen to them about what's going on for them? And I realized, like... A lot of them were jumping through a lot of hoops to make sure that some of us felt okay. And I was like, I can't, wow, I can't believe this is what's happening. And I should have seen it earlier. And as soon as I dropped all that shit and I realized and I looked at them and I noticed like, oh, they're not telling me what to do because I'm a girl. They're telling me what to do because I'm their teammate. And they're outside of my body and they can see what I'm doing. <laughs> and I can't. And they played baseball in high school. I didn't play baseball in high school. Hell, I didn't even play organized baseball ever. I never got instruction. I realized like, oh, I'm getting, I'm finally getting this thing that I wanted. They're telling me how to play baseball better. And I started listening to it and I started playing baseball better. And then I felt like I was even more part of a team because I wasn't out on the field to like prove something or I wasn't saying, oh, I don't, I don't want to be good at this thing. Leave me alone. I, I was actually like, I want to be good and I want to play as a team. And we started playing as a team. I mean, I've never played baseball as good as I played it from August to November. I made a play in the last game of the series that was like straight up, like I, it, look, pe people were telling me this. This is why I'm saying, I, it was like a pro move. <laughs> I like knocked a ball down. I have a tendency to like get on the ground a lot because I use my body to stop the ball because I don't want it out of the infield. Hold it to a single instead of a double. You know what I mean? Um, I just always did that. Like when I played volleyball, I would slide all the time. But uh, so I, I knocked it down and I had the presence of mind to go throw it to second. And I didn't. It was a sideways toss to second. Perfect toss right into my shortstop's glove. I've never played like that before. I mean, I played well, but not like that. It was like I knew what to do all the time. Even when I made mistakes, I was like, ah, oh, I see what I did. So anyway, my whole point was I've just like... I've already been friends with these guys for life, but I feel like I made these friends for life in a new way. And like, I earned the respect of my team in a new way. And it was complicated. And I wasn't in it for that, but that's what I got. And it's honestly changed my life and it's changed my perspective on a lot of things. Because like, this whole thing is long. Life is long. It's really long. And you gotta look at what's right in front of you. Sometimes. 
Sometimes, sometimes you have to look at who's standing in front of you, what they're doing, and why they're doing it. And it's not always out here. Not everybody is behaving based off of these cultural things that we need to tear down and discuss. Because we do need to do that. But sometimes they're just a person who's like, I want to say this to this person. <laughs> and if you choose to just listen, sometimes it's only about that. Sometimes. Hear me on this. Really hear me on this. Sometimes. <laughs> but often people, people's intentions are good. That's what I've learned. Often people's intentions are good. And if you operate based off of that, everything changes a little bit. And life is a little bit more livable. So on to men's baseball awards. So we've got the AL MVP and the finalists were Mike Trout as almost always, Jose Ramirez and Mookie Betts. And the winner by far was Mookie Betts. If Mookie Betts did not get this award, I would have been very upset. <laughs> but I'm glad that he did. He hit 346, 438, 640, leading the AL in batting average and slugging percentage while hitting 47 doubles, 32 home runs, and stealing 30 bases. So he was by far in the 30-30-30 club. Um, remember when everybody was like, Hanley Ramirez is going to be in the 30-30-30 club. Hanley Ramirez is not playing baseball. Um, Jose Ramirez had a great, what, three quarters of a season, and then he flattened out. Um, Cleveland really flattens out at the end of the season. That's one of their big problems, and they seem to be having a fire sale, and they seem to not want to spend any money. They've openly said they will not spend money to buy a ring, or to get a ring, but it is buying a ring. Um, so I don't see Cleveland winning the World Series anytime soon. Um, and a side note, uh, Cleveland has now dropped Wahoo, uh, from their logo set and from their uniforms. Uh, love to see people on Twitter saying there's no Native Americans that care about it. Now, I would point out something that I, I have been thinking about a lot lately, which is that I am sure that there is a majority population, or let's just say population, of indigenous Native people. Um, I also don't... And just si side note, uh, I refrain from using the phrase Native American because... Not every person who identifies as Native or Indigenous likes to identify as an American because it wasn't necessarily a choice that they made. So I try to go for the one that describes more people and just out of kindness. This isn't like, you know, I'm not getting a Medal of Honor here. Um, I'm just telling people that's why I do that. And maybe you should too. I don't know. It's just a kindness. It's not, there's a lot of other things we need to get done or should be doing. And that's what I, the point I'm going to get to. But native indigenous people in this country on this continent um that this logo in major league baseball is perhaps not the number one priority for them in terms of um their culture or their the people or their population because there are a lot of issues obviously uh oppressive issues against indigenous and native population in this country so that I do agree and understand is like perhaps many people don't care because there are other things like missing and murdered indigenous uh, women and girls that is a major issue that our government doesn't give a shit about. So that, you know, missing human beings is a much bigger issue than a Major League Baseball team's logo for sure. But to me, the logo is representative of these issues and our nonchalance towards it. Uh, and the fact that we will walk around wearing that logo and not give a shit about a population of people and what's going on for them is, to me, th the issue. So for that reason, I'm glad it's gone because it's, it's, it represents that. And I don't want to forget that either and just be like, oh, everything's great now because it's not because there are still people suffering. Um, but the logo is gone now. I hope that the team name will change at some point. I'm still, you know, not gonna wear their shit necessarily. I have like, I have the block C hat and I have a hat that's just got a C on it that I like. So I might occasionally represent Cleveland, but um, it's still, the name is still bad. And then the, the everything that's behind it is still bad. So I, I don't know. Look, everybody's complicated. Uh, I like sometimes wearing the thing that doesn't have that guy on it because then it's like, hey, I'm whatever. But at the same time, I don't know. I don't know. But if I wear it, then you're thinking about it and you're thinking about the same thing that I said. Because if you erase it and you never think about it, then you're never thinking about it. So poor Mike Trout, just the best, <laughs> one of the best players in the game, doesn't make it to the playoffs. 
doesn't get the MVP. It's just, it's a sad, sad dude. The NL MVP uh, was between Javi Baez, Nolan Arenado, and Christian Yelich. And Christian Yelich won it. Um, he nearly won the Triple Crown. by He missed it by, what, one RBI? Which is crazy. <laughs> one run batted in. Um, and he led the Brewers to the best record in the National League in his first year with Milwaukee. Yelich received 29 out of 30 first place votes in a runaway, with Baez finishing a distant second and Arenado third. Baez had a wonderful season, and I do feel like it's a bummer that he couldn't get it. But he also fell flat near the end of the season, too. He was also really exciting, really exciting to watch. I had him very early on in my fantasy baseball team. I was like, well, he's going to flatten out, but he never did. Because <laughs> he like cha- he completely changed his swing. Um, he is one of the few Cubs that I will admit to liking. Um, I wish he played for somebody else so I could really like him. Anyway, I don't need to... Nolan Arenado had a great season, too. Just nothing like Christian Yelich's campaign, as they love to say it. Um, and NL Cy Young winner Jacob deGrom got the other... Well, oops, spoiler alert. Got the other first place vote and finished fifth in MVP balloting. So let's go on to the AL Cy Young. So that was between Justin Verlander, Corey Kluber, and Blake Snell. Um, I was also very much rooting for Blake Snell to win this award. I had him in my fantasy baseball. I had him in my points league and then I also had him in my categories league and then I dropped him in my categories league which was a big mistake but I won my categories league anyways <laughs> so that was my first time playing it so, for some reason my first time playing a fantasy baseball type I win I don't know I'm good at gambling I guess um so Blake Snell ended up winning he really did have just a tremendous season I know that Justin Verlander did also, but I was, I mean, I, I guess I watched more of Blake Snell, but he was literally unhittable for most, like, the season. It, he had a brief stint on the injury list, but uh, other than that, he was unhittable. Um, and so maybe I'll just be a Tampa Bay Rays fan. I don't know. The hat almost looks like my initials. So let's go for it. And Corey Kluber, kind of surprised that he's on there, honestly. Um, I mean, I guess it makes sense, but Corey Kluber is on the decline. I I just think he is, I mean, the the Cleveland, wow, I almost said the name, that's crazy. Um, Cleveland would be, I think, right to trade him right now if somebody wants to take that on. But he has, I think, some very serious back issues, which is, look, I love baseball. I also think that this whole, like, velocity throw, hurling the ball as hard as you can all the time is wearing these guys down even faster and the pitch count thing can't keep up with how bodies actually work and everybody's their backs are messed up man they're messed up like when John Smoltz calls a game sometimes he says like I can't even I can't even hold a baseball so what does that mean that's terrible uh but Justin Verlander I mean great season didn't do the same I I I, I don't know. Snell led the American League with 21 wins and a 1.89 ERA. And though he only pitched 180 and two-thirds innings, the Rays left-hander recorded 219 strikeouts. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, the voting was close, with Snell receiving 17 first-place votes to 13 for Verlander, outpacing the Astros right-hander uh, 169 points to 154. I also think Trevor Bauer was right to be like, why didn't I make it onto this thing? I mean, he's so annoying, but I, he also, like, I he was on MLB Network a little bit, uh, and he was like, they were talking about Puig, and they were like, what do you think? Is he good? You know, what? Whoa, like, ready for some whatever? And Trevor Bauer was like, I think he's good for the game. I love how he plays. I love his ex- excitement. I think he's really good for the game. And I was like, God damn it. Why do you, why, why? But again, that just goes back to the like joy and sadness. People are complicated. People are complicated. So based on performance alone, I think Trevor Bauer should have been included. Honestly, instead of Corey Kluwer. So moving on to the NL Cy Young, you already know who won because I tipped my hand on that one. But the uh, finalists were Max Scherzer, Aaron Nola, you know my Scherzer story, and Jacob deGrom. If you don't, it is that I could have drafted him and I drafted Joey Votto. Look, I what I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you. I just don't know what to tell you. Aaron Nola had a wonderful season also, but he just had did not have the support of a of a team that got him wins. There were so many he threw so many gems that he did not win. 
The only person that like outpaced that was Jacob DeGrom, the winner of the NL Cy Young. Poor run support meant DeGrom didn't get many actual wins, finishing just 10 and 9. But in terms of preventing runs, nobody was better than DeGrom with his 1.70 ERA in 32 starts with a career best 269 strikeouts in 217. Wow, that's a lot of strikeouts. He was mowing them down, dude. I did not get to see him pitch very much this year, and I should probably go back and watch some tape because I knew he was pitching well because I was following it, but I didn't get to see him pitch very much. Um, So let's move on to Rookie of the Year in the AL. We had Glaber Torres, Miguel Andujar, two Yankees, and then Shohei Otani. Who won? Um, I mean, look, both Andujar had a great second half. Torres had a bad second half. Otani got hurt. Okay. Um, the NL Rookie of the Year. I mean, I just like... Otani... There's something that I really love about Otani because like Japan and baseball... I, I don't think I need to say more than that. But I, I did get just like so sick of the, the hype of it. Really, really just... I don't like dislike him or anything, but I was just like, I don't, I'm bored. So I kind of checked out, but he was like filthy and he hit so many home runs. So it was fun. Let's see how he is this year, but he's going to get surgery. So I, I don't know. The NL rookie of the year was between Walker Bueller, Juan Soto and Ron, Ron, Ronald Acuna Jr. Who also won the rookie of the year. He hit the most leadoff home runs of any rookie and of, I think any Atlanta player. But all three of these players were very exciting to watch. So for me, th- it was a tough call. Juan Soto was just like, wow. <laughs> also, Walker Bueller in that uh, uh, 18-inning game that I went to was like lights out. That was nuts. Um, NL Manager of the Year. Let's flip it, flip it around for a second. We had Bud Black of the Rockies, Craig Council of the Brewers, and Brian Snicker of Atlanta. And Brian Snicker is the winner. And this is the one that I disagree with the most. I really think that I said Bud Black and then I changed my vote to Craig Council. And I still stand by that. Craig Council by far. I think he put together, he took a lot of pieces and he took had an approach that worked. Obviously it flamed out in the playoffs. And honestly, I wish they would have beaten the Dodgers. <laughs> because at least then I think that the, the World Series, I think Boston still would have won. Boston fans, I think Boston still would have won. So, superior team to everybody. However, I think it would have been at least like a series or something. I don't know. That would have been nice. I disagree with the snicker pick here. I, I I mean, Atlanta had a great season. I just don't. I look at Craig Council and what he did over the full season and, and the moves that he made and, and choices and plan that he, he went with. Un, it was both traditional and untraditional, non-traditional at the same time, which is something that I like in baseball. When you take a, a data-driven approach, but you also keep your eye on the goddamn field. That's what I liked about it. So AL Manager of the Year was between Alex Cora, Kevin Cash, and Bob Melvin. Alex Cora of the Red Sox, Kevin Cash of the Rays, and Bob Mel- Melvin of the A's. Now, Bob Melvin of the A's ended up being the winner, which is tough because Alex Cora was really good. And did the, also did the thing I was talking about with a little more gas on the traditional uh, focus, whereas Craig Council is a little bit more focused on the non-traditional focus with a traditional look. Uh, but, I mean, you cannot deny what Bob Melvin was able to do with, like, no money, basically. Um, the Red Sox have the highest one of the highest payrolls in baseball. Now, does that mean somebody's not a good manager just because they have, like, really expensive players? No. But... Um, I mean, it's hard to deny that the Oakland A's supposedly came out of nowhere, but this is the last time, at least in the year of our Lord 2018, that I will say, I knew that the A's were going to have this season. And I said it right here on this podcast, and I can't believe I haven't been on MLB Network. Was it a guess? No. (laughs) I I was looking at what they had, and I knew that they were going to have a great season. And they will continue to say on MLB Network, who knew that the A's were going to have this kind of a season? Rhea Butcher, host of Three Swings. So there you go. Anyway, so those are the awards. And then after this, we've got the Hall of Fame 2019 ballot, which has uh, come up. So here are the key storylines. And there's a lot of information in here, and I don't want to read all of it. Bench coach Brett did a great job. Should Mariano Rivera be the first unanimous Hall of Fame 
inductee. Closers typically face a divisive electorate when it comes to the Hall, but with a record 652 saves and an incredible .70 postseason ERA, Rivera is really in a class of his own. I say yes. Should Roy Halladay, Todd Helton, and or Andy Pettit be first ballot inductees? Roy Halladay, Andy Pettit, yes. Halladay, a pair of Cy Youngs and a pair of no-hitters, including one in the postseason, would figure to get the late Halliday over the hump, but his 203 wins may seem paltry to more traditional voters. Helton, only 19 players since 1900 have accrued 5,000 plate appearances and put up a 300, 400, 500 slash line, and Helton is one of them. Uh, I'm changing my vote to all three of them should be, yes. But so is Helton's former teammate Larry Walker, who's entering his ninth year on the ballot as a long shot. Voters are still wrapping their heads around the core's field factor, so Helton's candidacy could be debated for a while. It's unfortunate that a team, simply based on location, is penalized for it. Like, we all agreed to put the team there, so why do they get penalized just because, like, the ball flies out of there? It's not really fair. I mean, the Yan- look at the way the Yankee Stadium looks. We're going to penalize the Yankees. We clearly are not going to. So Andy Pettit, postseason moments are strong boosters for election, and no pitcher has more wins in October than Pettit, but he also has a 3.85 career ERA and admitted, and admitted to using human growth hormones. I, the, the whole PED part of it for me is so complicated because I think it's bullshit that we're like penal. Obviously, I've spent many hours on this podcast like bemoaning it and thinking that domestic violence is the much bigger issue here. So for me, I mean, I don't know. There's, do you know how many drugs are in the hall of fame of other drugs and alcohol are in the hall of fame? I I don't know. It's impossible. It's impossible to have like a black and white view on, on it. So I don't know. I think all three of those guys should be, but they're probably not going to be. It's the last chance for Edgar Martinez and Fred McGriff Do either make it over the hump. Uh, Edgar Martinez gained 70.4% of the vote last year, just shy of the 75% threshold. Each of the past 10 players who received between 70 to 74% of the BBWAA vote gained election the very next year, and every candidate who's crossed the 70% threshold has eventually gotten into Cooperstown via either the BBWAA or a Veterans Committee. Things are looking good for Edgar Martinez. I think he deserves it. And Fred McGriff only won 23.2% of the vote last year, despite his 134 adjusted OPS and 493 home runs. I mean, personally, I'm a big fan of the crime dog, but I understand that he's not going to maybe make it in. Um, But man, how many of you did his swing when you were a kid with the wiffle bat? I mean, I did all the time. It probably didn't help (laughs) me setting up my baseball skills. But, you know, I mean, I, I, I love that guy, but I also understand, like, he's kind of a fringe dude, even though, I mean, 493 home runs? That's seven shy of 500. That's a lot of home runs. Uh, will Kurt Schilling's vote total increase after dropping seven points to 45% in 2017 due to his proliferation of racist memes, transphobic tweets, and threats of violence against the media? The Breitbart radio show host saw his vote total bounced back to 51.2% in 2018. Of course he did. In 2018, with four chances left, what's the likelihood that Schilling makes the haul? Uh, I want to say not good, but it's probably good. I mean, that bloody sock is, like, ingrained in baseball's memory, and I don't like the guy at all, and, like, I do believe in giving people second chances, but not that guy. I just, like, I don't like him. I don't like him, so it's personal with me. Uh, Other notable return candidates, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Mike Messina, Sammy Sosa, Manny Ramirez, Larry Walker, Omar Vizquel, one of my favorite dudes, Andrew Jones, Scott Rowland, Jeff Kent, Gary Sheffield, Billy Wagner. Like, all of those names are, to me, Hall of Famers. I mean, I'm not a big Roger Clemens fan either, but like, at least, I mean, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Mike Messina, Sammy Sosa, Manny Ramirez, those are Hall of Famers to me. Uh, and then Omar Vizquel is a Hall of Famer of my in my heart. And also, Gary Sheffield. Gary fucking Sheffield. The fact that he played for, like, a bunch of different teams is weighing on his, like, legend or whatever. It's Isn't that nuts? That, like, the fact that he wasn't, like, a, a one-team or two-team guy, people, like, look at him as, like, cheap or something. And I know that because I think that because I have been ingrained in baseball. But I don't actually think that. Gary Sheffield is a Hall of Famer. Mark my words. <laughs> He's a Hall of Famer. Um, so those are that's the rundown of that. Um, and we'll be back right after this. I don't have any rosin bag. 
but I'll give you an outro right after this. What do I love about Tomboy X? Number one, they are an inclusive company. They use, number one, their products are made for everybody. We've talked about that so many times. I'll tell you about it again. They make their products for everybody, by everybody, and you see them on everybody. If you haven't already, you should follow Tomboy X on Instagram. They have a myriad models for their awesome underwear, um, from athletes to artists to people. <laughs> I, I just say it's they're a wonderful company doing wonderful things, and you should fill up all of your drawers with their drawers. It's time to stop wearing underwear that doesn't make you feel confident. And you can wear Tomboy X's underwear and feel confident, not just because it fits you so well, but because it's a company that cares, that's trying, that cares, that gives back. It's underwear that has more frills than function. Oop, doop, 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 doop. You don't want to wear underwear that has more frills than function or underwear that your mom got to fem you up. You want underwear that's made to fit you and how you see yourself. That's what you need. I know it seems silly, to think about underwear this way, but it's the first thing you put on. I mean, unless you're creating a new style and you wear your underwear on the outside, which is like, hey, cool, give it a shot. Uh, they make bikinis, briefs, boxer briefs, uh, soft bras, which I like to wear. Um, I wear a binder a lot because it makes my shirts look the way I want them to look, but on the off days, because you got to protect that tissue, their soft bras are a wonderful thing to wear on those off days. Uh, they make racerback bras, too, more for sporty stuff, and in everyday basic colors, fun seasonal prints, and brilliant colors. And as always, all options come in extra small to 4X. So, regardless of where you fall on the size or gender spectrum, Tomboy X offers amazing underwear that any body feels comfortable in. So go to TomboyX.com slash baseball and check out their special bundles and pack pricing. And three swings listeners get an extra 15% off with code baseball. Again, code baseball for an extra 15% off. So ditch whatever you're wearing for a pair of Tomboy X underwear. Go to TomboyX.com slash baseball. Well, holy moly, I did it. There's an episode. I'm hoping it comes out on Thanksgiving, but it might not. And I don't know. I've, this is what I've been saying to people. Happy holiday if you celebrate it. Uh, I don't really celebrate it necessarily. I'm going to hang with people. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're at where we're at. So it's a good day for reflection. Um, it's also like Native History Month. So maybe spend some time with that. Um, donate some money if you can to an indigenous slash native uh, cause or maybe buy some stuff from some uh, native artists. Uh, yes, or like, you know, if you want to uh, give put some money where your mouth is, you can buy some art from the tremendous artist uh, Jamie Okuma, who is somebody that I got to see speak at a um, good company design sponge um, piece thing. I was in that magazine also recently, so pick up that issue but it was wonderful to hear her story and uh i've her artwork is amazing so like do stuff like that and uh you know like really really dig in to friends and family really be present this holiday and the upcoming holiday season be present with people instead of getting them presents be present oh no oh no i'm becoming a cult leader <laughs> okay so this is the end of the episode, and what I'm going to say is, I there's a couple people, it's difficult to set up a guest and have a movie and do all these things. So I'm working on it, I'm trying to get there. I am going to try my darndest to get a movie episode of Three Swings out this December for your listening pleasure. And then after that, a little bit of a break, and then with the holidays and everything, and then be back at the beginning of next year. And we'll get some movie reviews. I'm going to try to do a live one. I'm going to save the movie that you all want to hear me review for that one. And if it doesn't happen, I'll review it with somebody else. So, thank you for sticking around. Um, donate your money if you can. If you can't donate money, spend it in good places. Uh, and then if you can't do both of those things, try to be kind to people this holiday season. And also, like I said... Maybe don't buy so many presents and just be present with people. Oh boy. Welcome to my cult. So, if you like this show, maybe let somebody know about it. Face-to-face, -face, not just on the internet. I like it on the internet, but also face-to-face. -face. That's a good way 
conversation starter. It's fun to talk to people. Give us a review on iTunes. Uh, that helps a lot with the show. Subscribe on iTunes or use Stitcher or Spotify or anywhere else that you listen to things. Um, those are all great. You can follow me at Rhea Butcher and you can follow Forever Dog at, at Forever Dog something. I can't remember what it is. I think it's at Forever Dog Prod or something. Um, look, I'm good at my job. Um, also, I have some stand updates coming up. So I would love to see you all. And I'm going to say them on here because not all of them are fully announced yet, but I'm going to let you know ahead of time so you know what's going on. So January 19th, I'll be at Mississippi Studios. There's a second show added because the first show sold out. Second show's at 10. That link is going to be up on my website. January 20th, I'll be at the Crocodile Cafe in Seattle, Washington. Uh, And then there's a San Francisco date that's sort of circling around that weekend. So keep an eye out, San Francisco. February 16th, I'll be at the Frida Cinema at, in Santa Ana, California. On March 1st, I'll be in Chicago. You'll get more information, but Chicagoans, put that on your calendar. March 2nd, I'll be in New York. New Yorkers, put it on your calendar and shit. Was that Boston? I don't know. And then March 7th through the 9th, I will be at the Vermont Comedy Club in Burlington, Vermont. I've never been to Vermont. This is going to be my first time. It's going to be interesting. Those tickets are on my website. And then March 19th through the 23rd, I will be at the Amphibian Stage in Fort Worth, Texas. A bunch of shows. And there's also some Arizona dates that are floating around in March. So keep an eye out for that. So, as always, if you liked it, you liked it. Forever Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Executive produced by Brett Boehm. Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog 